All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to team eight so that they can um, give your introduction and then you can take it from there, Dr. You. Wonderful, looking forward to it. Welcome to our second guest speaker lecture from Dr. Timothy Yu. Dr. Yu has completed his undergraduate degree in biochemistry and molecular biology from Harvard College and graduated UC San Francisco with a PhD in neuroscience. He completed his residency and fellowship in Massachusetts General Hospital and Brigham and Women's Hospital, and is currently a physician and researcher at the Boston Children's Hospital. He is the principal investigator with the U Laboratory, and he also is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and associate member of the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. Dr. Timothy Yu's laboratory specializes in genomics, bioinformatics, and neuroscience. And in particular, he researches human gene knockouts as a cause of autism spectrum disorder, various genetic mutations that give rise to neurological phenotypes, rare genetic mutations that link neurological signaling pathways with, in this case, rare genetic diseases, and therefore helps accelerate processes between lab research and clinical application. Of particular interest, is his work on whole genome sequencing as a way to supplement and perhaps ultimately replace the current newborn screening approach, which will help further, uh, further increase the speed at which we can, uh, genetic, we can find the genetic conditions in newborns that will otherwise be life-threatening and therefore provide early detection and ways of treatment. In addition to this research, he is also working on individualized RNA therapeutics. Recent developments in gene sequencing have made diagnosing certain conditions effective, but therapy is still lacking. Recently, Dr. Yu's research team has shown that RNA modulating intersense oligonucleotides can shorten the time between diagnosis and treatment. This has the potential to create practical and individualized medicines. I'd like to let Dr. Yu take it. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, I wish I could be with you in person, uh, but virtual will have to do. Uh, and I look forward to sp spending this time with you and uh, answering any questions that you might have. Um, thank you for the chance to come to speak with you and for that uh, kind and comprehensive introduction. So let me go ahead and start sharing my screen and uh, we'll get this on, uh, get this going. Oh, let's take a look here. Is that showing up for you all? Yep. All right, good. So uh, as your colleagues mentioned, uh, I am in the Division of Genetics and Genomics at Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, I am a uh, clinically trained as a neurologist and I run a research group here in the Division of Genetics and Genomics. And the title of my talk that I'd like to be discuss with you, this topic is uh, Making Genetic Medicine Personal. Uh, first, uh, my disclosures, I, I do serve uh, on the Scientific Advisory uh, Board uh, on an ad hoc basis for uh, a few companies, Asai, Biomarin, and Takeda. Um, I also uh, serve as a volunteer advisor to a number of nonprofits uh, largely in the uh, rare disease and genetics space. Um, I thought I'd start by um, giving you a little bit of background about myself. Um, some of that was uh, mentioned in the introduction, but I thought I'd expand a little bit more on it because I think it's helpful to know when you're talking to someone or hearing from someone uh, what their prior training experience had been and how that might uh, influence the way that they present their work, influence the way that you hear it, um, and sort of see the trajectory that uh, led the speaker to presenting the topic of the day. So um, with that uh, context in mind, uh, as uh, your colleagues uh, stated, uh, I was an undergraduate biochemistry and molecular biology major at Harvard. Uh, I finished there in the class of 1994, a little while ago. Um, and then from there moved on to uh, my next move, which was uh, to pursue MD-PhD training uh, at the University of California at San Francisco. There, um, I actually got taken up by neuroscience and molecular genetics. And it was uh, my great uh, pleasure uh, to work uh, on my PhD there for several years in 
the model organism uh, C. elegans. Uh, C. elegans is uh, a model system. I don't know whether you get exposure to it in SSP, but it's a fantastic system uh, for studying all aspects of, uh, of organismal development. In particular, it's especially powerful for understanding how you build a brain. Uh, every single neuron within the worm uh, has been identified to the level of being able to draw a family tree. Um, and its location and its connectivity has been reconstructed uh, from uh, light microscopy as well as electron microscopy. For my PhD, I had the uh, job of using this uh, wiring diagram uh, that had been built for the worm to actually understand what are the molecular cues that help set up that wiring diagram. How does a developing neuron tra travel long distances to reach its intended targets? How does it recognize where it's supposed to go, being attracted towards things that uh, tell it to go in the correct direction? Um, how does it get directed away from areas that are no-fly zones? How, does it, how is it repelled from other parts of the body where it's not supposed to go? Um, and that uh, was a, a wonderful grad school experience. If anyone is thinking about graduate school, um, one of the wonders of working in C. elegans is that it has a short generation time of just four days, and you can do a lot of experiments. You can develop a lot of hypotheses, do a lot of elegant uh, tests of those hypotheses, and you can do it on a short time frame. Um, so uh, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a wonderful organism to study if anyone is thinking about it. And uh, my advisor, Corey Barglin, was a fantastic uh, PhD mentor during that time. After that, um, I did residency and fellowship. I did uh, clinical neurology training. Uh, I was part of the MD-PhD program uh, and then uh, followed that up. Uh, the closest match to my scientific interest was neurology. And so I did uh, that residency and chief residency at Massachusetts General Hospital. And following residency, I did a brief two-year combined clinical and research fellowship uh, looking at the care of patients with neurodevelopmental disorders, autism and others. And uh, finally, at the same time I was doing my uh, research uh, fellowship, clinical and research fellowship, I was also doing a postdoc in the lab. And here um, I was working to take what I had learned from molecular genetics from C. elegans and apply it to human genetics. Um, and there I had the good fortune of being working in human genetics during a time when next generation sequencing was just coming on board. And so the ability to sequence exomes and genomes at the drop of a hat uh, led to a really incredibly productive time. This, these tools were just becoming online uh, in 2008, 2009, 2010. And um, we were very, very early adopters of this technology, uh, learning how to use and apply next-gen sequencing to uh, sequence human genomes um, and using that to study uh, neurologic diseases and uh, find uh, the cause of brain malformations for approximately a dozen different conditions uh, during my, my postdoc time. That was with uh, Chris Walsh, the chief of the Division of Genetics and Genomics at Boston Children's. So that's a little bit about my background. What I've neglected to, 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 to mention, but will uh, remedy now is my most important piece of background. Uh, I was actually a member of the SS, SSP uh, class of 1989 uh, in the astronomy program, actually. This is what back when it was held at Ojai, California, uh, and have fond memories of sleeping out under the stars and uh, observing asteroids under the telescope there. Uh, but that's another story. I understand that you might have heard from a, a classmate of mine, uh, another fellow SSP 89 classmate, Peter Park, who is a professor of computational biology at Harvard Medical School. Um, so he and I um, were uh, dorm mates uh, in, that, in that summer. So um, that's a long-winded background about myself, but now uh, I have the pleasure of working with a research group of some 20 people. Here are some of them crammed into our conference room. Um, and these are some of the areas that we work on. We work on understanding the underpinnings of human brain development, on uh, how that relates to normal development as well as abnormal development, for instance, for instance, in autism and other disorders. We continue to work on the tool on tool development and informatics analysis of uh, human genome sequencing. And uh, the topic of my uh, talk today is going to be this bottom white right quadrant uh, talking about how these tools are being increasingly uh, 
fruitfully applied to genomic medicine. The central problem that we've been working on the last five years is framed by the following few slides. Uh, the advent of genome sequencing has led to an absolute revolution in our ability to discover the causes of human diseases. And it's been such an explosion that in the last several years, we've seen uh, the number of genetic diseases that with a known molecular etiology uh, just go up exponentially. Um, here, uh, it's estimated that there are now some 7,000 distinct different genetic diseases that we can now name and more, efficient, more, ever, more efficiently than ever diagnose for patients who present to medical care. The challenge though, is that of these approximately 7,000, there are only 500 today, a tiny fraction that have any sorts of treatment associated with it. Worse, the conditions that we're finding are also incredibly rare. These genetic conditions, the great majority of them, over 90% of them involve many, many fewer than a thousand individuals total in the world. And that means that, that our prospects for making treatments for them is really bounded by the fact that the, that the companies that are traditionally our uh, go-to for actually making uh, medicines for patients uh, find little economic motive to actually go after um, and develop treatments knowing that there may be just a handful of patients out there in the world to actually give it to. to uh, this actually highlights this um, yawning gap uh, which is that to really unlock the potential of genomic medicine, we have to uh, now get over the recent success that genome sequencing has accelerated our ability to diagnose patients and tackle this next problem, which is that developing treatments for these really uh, still currently takes a long time. To get a sense for how daunting the challenge is, well, let's throw some stats out. Uh, historically speaking, uh, drug development uh, is an incredibly expensive and time-consuming endeavor. It involves multiple steps that go from a biological proof of concept to manufacturing different drug candidates, release testing, formulating those for appropriate human biodistribution and half-life and stability, conducting sufficient animal safety tests to assure us that it's good enough for human use, organizing, designing, and executing phase one, two, and three clinical trials, seeking FDA approval. It's a very, very long process with many failures along the way. And statistics from as recent as 2014 uh, were really dismal. The industry cost for new drug approval was on the time scale, uh, was on the order of two and a half billion dollars. And the time from finding, for instance, a genetic target to actually having an approval for a drug was a ridiculous 14 years. The good news though, is that this is beginning to change. And um, our lab has been a, a part of that change. And I'd like to explain how. Um, for us, this all began in a very unexpected way. Our introduction to this problem and a an, uh, potential opportunity to fix it uh, came through a chance encounter with uh, one little girl who's shown on this slide here. And this is Mila. Uh, Mila, in this picture is a six-year-old girl. Uh, she's from Colorado. And uh, we met her in 2017 um, when she presented to us with a story of mysterious neurologic symptoms, which had been ongoing for several years. She had had a normal uh, infancy and a normal childhood. She was very coordinated. You can see her hair balancing on an upturned table. Uh, she grew up in California, in, in Colorado, and enjoyed hiking and, uh, and skiing and all sorts of outdoor activities with her family. But beginning around age four, she began having trouble seeing in low light. She began pulling books close up to her face at bedtime. Beginning at age five, this very coordinated little, little girl began to stumble. And her great grandmother commented one day to her mother that she seemed a little clumsy. And her mother thought, that's strange. She's never been clumsy before. She's always been precociously coordinated. And then uh, unfortunately at age six, um, these little subtle signs of vision and coordination difficulty uh, 
um, actually accelerated into a much more severe and a scary situation. Um, she lost her vision entirely that summer uh, when she was age six. Uh, and she, her stumbling uh, turned into falling. And then she began losing basic things like her ability to speak. First, she spoke voluminously in paragraphs. It dwindled to sentences and then phrases and then few words um, and uh, was an incredibly scary situation. Uh, she was worked up at Colorado Children's Hospital with uh, symptoms of vision loss, ataxia or incoordination and cognitive regression and had a very, very unfortunate diagnosis. Dr. Larson, her uh, expert pediatric geneticist performed a skin biopsy, which showed that she had something called Batten disease. Uh, what is Batten disease? Well, Batten disease is uh, actually a family of different diseases. There are 14 different forms of Batten disease. They're all caused by recessive mutations, meaning that there are two mutations, mutations in a copy from your mom and a copy from your dad, in critical genes involved in lysosomal biology. Lysosomes, as you know, are recycling organ organelles within the cell. They're responsible for disposing of cellular waste. In the absence of functional lysosomal genes, you see buildup of abnormal protein and lipid aggregates within the cytoplasm of these cells because they're unable to recycle them. And this slow and gradual buildup eventually chokes the cell, leads it to begin to dysfunction, and then eventually over time, years, uh, neurons with these inclusions begin to die. And this shows up in the retina, in the brain, and the spinal cord, and it causes the symptoms that she had begun to exhibit beginning at age four and progressing through age six. Her particular subtype of Batten disease was called CLN7 Batten disease. It's a rare subtype of this family of disorders with only 70 patients reported in the literature. And very sadly and scarily for the family, all of these patients uh, in the classical form of this disease uh, passed away typically by age 11. To um, put a face on that, disorder, uh, the science and the medicine I can rattle off, but I like to try to show a video and see if this works um, that describes this from the family's point of view. So our daughter's name is Mila Virginia Makovitz. Uh, she was born on November 5th, 2010. When I think about Mila as an infant, I think about smiles and laughter and health and... Half an hour after she was born, she was strong enough to hold on to my finger and I could almost pick her up off the bed. When Mila was a toddler, she was a climber. She was a hiker. She was a runner. <laughs> How old are you, Mila? <laughs> Here's our sugar high daughter. Very physical, always love to ride a strider. Nice, bud. Play in the snow, go sledding. I'm coming. We noticed that Mila was getting stuck on her words. She would say, mommy, mommy, I have to, mommy, I have to, and not be able to continue. And then suddenly around three years old, we started noticing that her feet were slightly unturned and she was walking strangely. And then at four years old, we noticed that she pulled books in close. And then around five years old, Mila's feet started moving really quickly in um, this strange pit pattering way. And then she would fall back on her butt. And every time she stood up, she would fall back and stand up and fall back. You know, we took her around to different doctors who never could really kind of figure out what was going on with her. And then time passes. And then in just one month, everything can change. She can no longer see anything. What's brought her so much happiness is playing with her toys and looking at her books and watching TV and playing with her brother. And suddenly it looked like she could no longer play with anything. It's so hard to see such a outgoing little girl 
not be able to play with other kids and not be able to play with toys and not be able to watch Elmo anymore. Children with Batten disease are destined to lose their vision, their ability to walk, their ability to talk. They lose their ability to swallow and they eventually become bedridden and they don't usually live until um, much after 10, 11, 12 years old. It's uh, such a rare disease that all the doctors that you see have never experienced it before. day of my life. It gave my life purpose and I just ask myself all the time, how is it possible that we have such a wonderful life? And then we had our son. Aslan, he's uh, two and a half, but uh, you know, he doesn't show any sign of being affected, but we know that uh, there is a chance that he is. The night before we took Mila into the hospital, he looked at me at the dinner table and said, Mommy, is Mila going to be okay? Our beautiful family and life seems like it's slipping away every day. Her smile and her laughter and her spirit is the same. If we want to save Mila's life and the life of other children who are suffering from this horrible disease, we need to raise $4 million right now to get a clinical trial up and running. We want to do everything that we can to stop other families from experiencing the pain that we're going through right now. So that was the video that uh, Mila's family had put together. And as you can see, it was, uh, this was in 2017. There was a link to a website. Uh, they had a GoFundMe page. And they were seeking to try to raise money to stimulate scientific research in CLN7. And in particular, they had actually connected to a gene therapy researcher, Dr. Stephen Gray, a very accomplished gene therapist who had built viral gene vectors for taking gene products and uh, heterologously expressing them uh, under different promoters within a viral capsid that could be introduced into the brains of individuals with neurologic disease and could be uh, therefore a gene replacement strategy for patients with CLN7. However, however, they were starting from scratch. They had, no one had begun working on trying to develop a treatment for this condition yet, uh, but the family had uh, decided that they were going to try to uh, support that effort as best as they could. So they put that video together and began raising funds um, on, again, on GoFundMe, but there was a wrinkle in their effort. And the wrinkle was the following. Uh, despite the CLN7 batten diagnosis and the skin biopsy showing that that was the likely culprit, they actually only had half of a diagnosis. What do I mean by that? Well, I mentioned that this disease is a recessive genetic disease. It requires two mutations. Both mother's copy and father's copy have to be disabled in order for you to uh, manifest this condition. And that's because very, very small amounts of proper functioning gene product, the CLN7 gene product, are necessary to stave off these symptoms. It's only if you're missing both copies that you develop the condition. Dr. Larson at Colorado had done appropriate genetic testing, clinical gene sequencing of the, of the uh, genes that cause Batten disease. And they had found a single mutation. This patient was heterozygous, one good copy, one bad copy, for a point mutation um, in the CLN7 gene. It's an aspartate 368 to histidine. It was a known mutation that had been seen before in concert with Batten patients, but the second mutation they could not find. So how could they be sure that this was the exact, uh, that was the correct diagnosis? 
how could they, uh, with an incomplete diagnosis here, how could they be sure whether or not their younger, uh, younger son, Aslan, Mila's little brother, um, had the disease or not? Uh, is it possible that he, she actually could have had a different form of Batten disease, not CLN7 or something uh, even more exotic and unusual? So the dirty secret, and the reason that this was such a challenging problem was that uh, clinical gene sequencing in 2017 uh, as well as most clinical gene sequencing in 2020 and 2022 um, is actually a very imperfect test. See, clinical sequencing these days focuses only on the protein coding portions of the genome. Um, and these are, uh, this is where most mutations are, but not all mutations are there. And there are significant blind spots if there are mutations anywhere else in the gene, in introns, structural variants, uh, rearrangements, gen genetic rearrangements, translocations. These are the types of mutations that can be missed by traditional clinical gene sequencing. And in fact, we know that th we've known this for quite some time. We aren't blind to this. Um, and people have known that whole genome sequencing would be the panacea. It should in principle be the answer to actually finding these missing mutations. However, back in 2017 and remaining so today, it remains uh, quite difficult to get whole genome sequencing as opposed to the more traditional clinical sequencing. So it was um, for that reason that actually we became connected to this family. You see, in 2017, we were not doing genetic therapies. We were not developing drugs for patients. We were doing whole genome sequencing and advancing the technology for how to interpret whole genome sequencing to find missing mutations. And so one Friday night in January of 2017, um, someone forwarded me the following Facebook post that had been put up by the family. This was uh, a post made to the Physician Mothers Group of Facebook, uh, a group of uh, uh, actually mostly mothers who are also doctors in Massachusetts who uh, share um, medical referrals and, uh, and tips and so forth on, on social media. Um, and someone on behalf of the family had put up this post saying that I'm hoping the power of the Physi Physician Moms Group can help my dear friend. Julie and I were college best friends. A six-year-old daughter had just been diagnosed with Batten disease and so forth. This post explained that they were looking for a researcher who could help them do whole genome sequencing, which was uh, scantily available back then. We were probably one of the first labs to ever do whole genome sequencing for patients because uh, we had been doing it since 2009 or so. And so when we saw this post, we decided we wanted to try to help. And so the next day we connected to the family's geneticist and found ourselves on, the on a phone call with him, Dr. Larson, uh, as well as mom and dad, Julia and Alec. Um, and we, uh, the following Monday, consented the family to try to help solve this mystery for them. Uh, on a week later, uh, they had had blood drawn at Colorado Children's Hospital and had it FedExed over to our lab in Boston. And uh, we put a rush on it. And a month later, we had completed whole genome sequencing of the family to try and solve this mystery. What did we find? Well, here is whole genome sequencing data from our patient, Mila, her mother in the second row, and her dad in the third row. And we're zoomed in tight here on the CLN7 locus. This is the area where the previous single mutation had been found. What did we see? Well, first, we found the previously identified clinical mutation, this C1102G to C, this was the missense mutation I had mentioned before. And we found it present in the heterozygous state in our patient, and it was inherited from her father. That was helpful because now we knew the inheritance pattern and we knew we were looking now for something that could possibly disable mother's copy of her CLN7 gene. And looking through this, we, uh, looked up and down and couldn't find anything in any of the regular protein coding regions of the gene. So we turned to manual inspection. And this is the IGV and integrated genome viewer uh, browser. And we began looking and found something unusual. We found this yellow circled uh, cluster of unusual reads deep within one of the introns of her gene. This was far away from any protein coding region. It was about a thousand nucleotides in from intro exon six and seven. And so therefore it's a region that's completely missed by clinical sequencing, which ignores these regions. So we zoomed in on it and we found that there were this cluster of unusual reads 
on closer inspection had some unusual features. They were all sharply demarcated. You know, normal whole genome sequencing is shotgun sequenced. And you see staggered reads that are from random places of the genome. They map generally in overlapping areas, but not all lined up with sharp demarcation points like this. Here, there are these two sharp breakpoints within the structure of the, these reads. These sharp breakpoints, it turned out, were software artifacts. These were soft clipped reads wherein the IGV browser had been set by default parameters to remove any bases that show significant, so significant mismatch with the reference sequence that they must be technical artifacts. When we turned off soft clipping, what we found was that there were actually heterologous sequences here that were found fused to the normal sequence, which lined up to the native locus. And on one side, there was normal native CLN7 sequence fused to a poly T stretch. On the other side, there was CLN7 sequence fused to a tandem hexameric repeat, repeating GGG, AGA, GGG, AGA over and over again. And interestingly enough, these two breakpoints were separated by uh, 14 nucleotides, this span here. These three clues were what it took for us to put together what had actually happened here. It took us a couple of days, and I don't know if anyone here in the audience recognizes this, but what we first realized after looking through a couple of different scenarios, first we considered whether this might've been a translocation whether part of this chromosome had become joined to another part of another chromosome, creating these heterologous bridges. But we couldn't map them cleanly to one additional chromosome and then back to this chromosome again. What we realized actually was that instead of a translocation, we were looking at an insertion, an insertion of foreign DNA at the site. The insertion began on one side with a poly T stretch, and then there was an additional sequence and then it ended in the hexameric repeat sequence. And uh, a long shaggy dog story ensued, which I won't bore you with, but we were able to uh, put together sort of a little molecular hangman game. What sequences begin with poly T and end with this hex hexameric repeat? There's a really esoteric family of sequences in the human genome that do that. They are uh, unusual sequences. Um, they are called retrotransposons or mobile DNA elements. Um, I don't know if folks here are familiar with these. Uh, retrotransposons are of a class of DNA called mobile DNA. They are jumping genes. They hop around in the genome. Um, and they are old genomic viruses that were acquired evolutionarily. And they have the ability to copy themselves and paste them into new locations in the genome. And if you're unfortunate enough to have one of these sequences copy itself and then paste it into a critical gene, they can cause disease. And there are approximately a dozen instances in the genome where this has been shown to happen in the past, case reports. Probably many more that are unreported. In her case, she had had a, a retrotransposon, the, the particular subclass is called an SVA retrotransposon, that's not important. Um, but it is of a family of uh, mobile DNA elements that are present in each of us in the room. Each of us has about 2,700 copies of these SVA retrotransposons in us. Luckily, they're mostly quiet, like extinct volcanoes, but once in a while they can pick up and hop. And that seems to have, occur have been what occurred in her. What did hers do? Well, it actually picked up and hopped and copied and pasted itself deep within an intron. And um, normally that wouldn't be bad for the gene, except that we hypothesized and then proved that this actually created a new splice site. And this new splice site was so strong that it actually competed with the native exon seven splice site and absorbed all the splice product from exon six, such that this new uh, insertion created a pseudo exon, a, a new novel synthetic exon that shouldn't be there. It had nonsense codons in all three frames and it led to early truncation of her gene. This allowed us to complete the diagnosis and it allowed us on the way to also confirm that her um, brother did not have this mutation. So we were able to clear him from having Batten disease. 
Now, um, this was also, this is a very unusual case, a, a, an unusual sort of esoteric case, perhaps only one that a molecular geneticist, geneticist could love, except that in this case, it had a further implication that led us to an entirely brand new uh, line of work. It prompted us to think, what if there are a way that we could actually fix this? What if we could silence this abnormal splicing event? And if we could silence this, we have the native exonic structure of this gene remaining intact, untouched by any mutations. So in theory, if we could hide this abnormal synthetic exon that had been created, could we actually restore a normal splicing pattern uh, to her gene and allow reconstitute a normal gene product and rescue her genetic defect? And how would we do that? Well, we, we thought about doing this using something called an antisense oligonucleotide. Antisense oligonucleotides. What are antisense oligonucleotides? Also known as ASOs. These are short snippets of synthetic DNA or RNA. They're not exactly native DNA or RNA. They've been chemically modified uh, by chemists over decades uh, for with various backbone modifications or modifications to the two prime hydroxyl group of the nucleotide ring that give them exceptional stability and tight binding. And there's over 30 years of experience using these for all sorts of purposes. You use them for something as simple and prosaic as PCR in the laboratory, but you also can use these as drugs. And they are coming into the fore in the last five years uh, for therapeutic applications. They're very easy to manufacture. You can order and design one of these and order it online and have it delivered to you in three weeks. They're easy to deliver to patients. You can give them IV or under the skin. For the brain, you can give them by spinal tap. And when they are administered this way, they home in to their genetic targets via traditional ATGC base pairing. And so you can use them to target whatever gene you, you choose. And depending on how you constru construct it, you can target that RNA for destruction, or you can use it to alter patterns of gene splicing. Now, the canonical example of an ASO drug, which we were learning about and reading about in 2017 at the same time we were looking at our patient's mutation, is a drug called Spinraza or Nusinersen. It's hard to pronounce, it took me a couple of times, but here is a paper in the New England Journal that was just coming out the same time that we met our patient, showing that this uh, antisense oligonucleotide drug, uh, an, anti an ASO drug consisting of the, these 18 letters shown in green, when given to patients with a neurologic neurodegenerative condition, these are babies who are born uh, floppy because they have low muscle tone and they get weaker and weaker because spinal motor neurons begin to die. And by the time they're age one, they cannot support their own breathing. Using a drug called nusinersen, this 18 nucleotide synthetic RNA, you can target a gene called SMN2, which stands for survival of motor neuron two. And this is a gene which is inactivated in each of our genomes by an evolutionarily acquired mutation that leads to skipping of exon seven. However, uh, the nusinersen drug, when administered to babies, homes in on this region near that splice site and actually changes the splicing pattern so that now exon seven can be included. And this drug, um, it has a very elegant, this very elegant mechanism of action, but most impressively clinically, it was an amazing success. Uh, the, these infants who were born weak and got weaker uh, now actually, when given this drug three times per year by spinal tap, uh, were um, getting, gaining strength, gaining milestones, able to sit and stand at one years of age, able to walk and then run by two years of age. Um, and really these patients, uh, it's had a striking uh, and amazing benefit for these patients. And so it provided a template for us to think could we play the same ASO trick for our patient? So we set out to try to make a version of Nusinersen for our patient. And Jin Cook and Aubrey, two members of my laboratory, set out to begin designing a patient customized splice changing ASO that was tailored to the specific SVA mutation that our patient had. And so we predicted the cis regulatory splice sequences around our patient's mutation. We targeted the splice acceptor for this exon that we wanted to get rid of and tiled antisense oligonucleotides over that and around it. 
we harvested skin cells from our patient and also blood cells from her blood um, and cultured those in the laboratory and used them as test beds to screen our drugs. Yep. We designed simple RT-PCR splicing assays to amplify both the normal splice product or the mutant splice product and identify drugs, candidate drugs that could boost the ratio of the normal splice product at the expense of the abnormal. We did RNA sequencing experiments using our patient's own cells, transfected with nothing, with a scrambled oligonucleotide, or with our uh, lead antisense oligo, and showed that if you administered our lead antisense oligonucleotide, you could actually boost the amount of normal splicing by three to five times over baseline. And we worked with uh, colleagues like Joe Mazzulli at Northwestern to perform lysosomal functional assays looking at normal cells in the top left here, the cytoplasm is nice and clean. Looking at the MFSD8 mutant cells right next to it, you see these white bubbles. These are our patient's cells, showing the accumulation of abnormal storage material within the cytoplasm because of lysosomal dysfunction. We treated these cells for just 24 hours with our antisense oligonucleotide and saw the amount of that cytoplasmic accumulation, those white bubbles melt away. And by this uh, very simple visual, as well as a number of other high throughput, uh, high content imaging, uh, looking at lysosomal mass, autofluorescence, and uh, autophagy, uh, we were able to see that uh, our ASO could rescue the health of her cells. Finally, we also showed that this could all happen at uh, concentrations that were similar to Spinraza or Nusinersen. These were happening not with artificially sky high levels of our drug, but they were actually happening at nanomolar levels of drug these were comparable to the commercially developed Spinraza or Nusinersen for spinal muscular atrophy. This uh, work uh, was exciting. Uh, our lab did it uh, with a real sense of urgency and purpose because our patient had an active neurologic disease, was declining, um, and uh, had a very short prognosis. But we recognized that there was you know, much left to be done. That was just proof of concept. And to actually get all of this through to a treatment, normally there'd be many further steps required downstream. Um, but we had moved with a sense of urgency throughout this whole process from first contacting the family in January, 2017 to designing ASOs in June of 2017 to actually seeing by October that we were seeing rescue of her cells that we didn't want to stop there. We wanted to keep our momentum. We should say though, that it wasn't a thoughtless decision to actually to try to treat our patient. There were many ethical and clinical considerations that had to come into play. We considered the fact that this was a very compelling medical need. This is a fatal condition with no alternative treatments. And so even though as a doctor, your ethos is first do no harm, we have to consider that uh, lack of intervention has a very clear and um, a very clear and fatal outcome for the patient. So the risks of treatment here that we were considering had to be balanced against the risks of no treatment, the risks of the disease's natural course itself. Second, we factored in the fact that the, this was a hypothesis-driven um, effort uh, with significant amount of prior data. This is a single gene disorder, a Mendelian disorder. We had an identified mutation. We had a model in the laboratory. We had a scientifically feasible fix. This was a genetically targeted treatment that arguably boosted the odds of positive impact. We were treating the root cause. This was not taking Tylenol to reduce a fever, something symptomatic, this was the root cause. Finally, um, it turned out our patient's mutation was unique. We had not found it in any other patients except for her. And our drug was tailored to that specific mutation. What that meant was that we were not talking about a trial that we could en enroll a dozen people in. This was actually a single patient intervention. It was much more like going to your surgeon and saying, my odds aren't good. There's a risky surgery available. Should we consider this? And with proper thought and consent, that is more like a procedure that one would agree to, not so much a broadly marketed and enrolled uh, trial. So we decided to proceed. And to do this, uh, I want to acknowledge we had lots of help. We went to the FDA, FDA Oligonucleotides Therapeutics Conference. There was a trade conference happening in DC right about the time that we were making this decision. And the president of the Oligotherapeutics Society connected us to many different industry consultants in the space because we had never 
designed a drug before. We were a traditional academic laboratory. And working together with, uh, with uh, pro bono consultants from industry, as well as uh, pro bono regula regulator uh, consultants, uh, these are folks from the FDA, um, we crafted a program to uh, submit this for approval to the FDA via something called expanded access, which is a compassionate use avenue that the FDA maintains for uh, allowing patients with uh, life-threatening conditions to have access to drugs that aren't tested in the traditional way. That being said, this was actually the very first time that this route had been used for a brand new drug, uh, a, dr a drug that was actually made for that patient. Uh, usually this route is used for uh, applying drugs that have been repurposed from uh, some other indication. And so as such, we actually had to navigate lots of uh, gray areas in the guidance. The, the, there is no guidance for the FDA, from the FDA for custom drugs because custom drugs of this nature had not existed prior to Mila. Um, and just simple things like, how do you find someone to manufacture it on a short time frame? Um, the scale of manufacture for a single patient as, to, as opposed to a large trial was 10 to 15 times smaller than most manufacturers were used to. Uh, most manufacturers would have taken about a year to actually orchestrate the campaign, but we told them that we needed it in weeks. Um, and how do you actually do that in weeks while make, making sure that it's safe enough uh, for single patient use while balancing risk and urgency? We put all of this together though, um, and with lots of help put together, not only a manufacturing plan, but an animal safety plan where we tested our drug in over a hundred rats before giving it to our patient and um, put this all together with a time frame of just months, three months to get from um, our proof of concept through uh, safety studies in animals uh, and launching of a trial. Uh, our family arrived in Boston, uh, January 13th, 2018, just a year and a week after we first met her. And then we got permission from the FDA to uh, initiate our clinical trial on the January 19th. We actually had not uh, received the drug yet. The drug was still being made, but it came shipped from a Florida manufacturer um, in the vials uh, the week after, January 25th. And we had prepared a clinical protocol for dosing our patient where we would combine a phase one trial, with, which is usually a safety oriented study with dose escalations. So we combine a phase one with a phase two trial where we were beginning to look for efficacy as well. And we gave tiny doses at the beginning and then increase them gradually to increase our patient's exposure to minimize and manage risk as we tried this new experimental therapy. This was our protocol. We actually began executing it on January 31st, 2018, again, a year after meeting our patient. And how did we do? This trial has gotten a lot of uh, press um, as a first example of individualized medicine. And uh, the reason that it's gotten a lot of press is that it actually um, performed much better than would have reasonably been expected, to be honest. I think a drug, a first attempt like this, one would be happy to show safety, but uh, we actually found significant evidence of efficacy in that first year. Shown here are seizures for our patients, it's a little fuzzy, I'm sorry. Our patient was having between 10 and 30 seizures per day. Before the onset of the trial, there were also seizures that were lasting greater than a minute generalized tonic-clonic seizures involving all four extremities, lasting quite a long time, 20 minutes per day spent in seizures. And then afterwards, each seizure, there would be a postictal confusion state. After five months of dose escalation, three and a half milligrams, seven, 14, 21, up to 42 milligrams, our patient's seizure frequency had dropped to between zero and 10 per day. And you'll also notice that these dark circles are becoming light circles uh, that indicates that the duration of the seizures was also shrinking. Our patient seizures went from lasting greater than a minute to in June and July lasting just a few seconds. So fleeting that most patients who are not, uh, most patient visitors who are not neurologists actually miss them entirely. Um, so they became uh, overall, uh, there was an overall six fold reduction in the number and duration of seizures all put together. That was the first year. Those trends were persistent and uh, consistent throughout the second year. Um, in year two, you can see that we uh, decided to uh, bump up and give a couple extra doses and then increase the dose. I'll explain why in a moment. 
And we saw that as the dose went up, her seizure frequency seemed to respond and came down a bit further. All sorts of necessary caveats here. This is a single patient study. This is not how we traditionally run clinical trials. Normally you would want five, 10 patients to, or even more to actually see these trends, um, but we're working with what we've had. And so by these measures, we saw clear signs of improvement in seizures over the first two years. How otherwise did she do? During this time, her family reported improvements in her quality of life, in her responsiveness, in her muscle tone, a number of other soft signs that are difficult as a clinical neurologist to capture objectively, but they were very pleased with how she was doing. However, I wish I could say that everything went as well as the seizures. And at the same time we were monitoring her seizures, we were also monitoring serial brain images to look at the size of her brain. Her brain was show, had been slowly shrinking for the four years prior to her enrollment in our study. And we were hoping that, that that would stop. It did not stop. And it might have slowed, but it did not stop. It gradually did shrink over the course of our trial. And what we saw beginning at the end of year two and then into year three was that as her brain volume loss dis, uh, progressed, despite the increase in seizures, uh, she became gradually less responsive and socially uh, responsive to her family. We think that we arrived too late. We think that uh, neurodegenerative disease processes like this take on a life of their own after a certain number of years. And that while we uh, were in time to help save some neurons, there are many other neurons that had begun the dying process and uh, could not be saved. And uh, with that um, in mind, uh, in year three, um, in concert with the family and her uh, caregivers in Colorado, um, all involved made the very difficult decision that she would transfer to hospice care to um, focus on her quality of life and her, and her comfort. And she passed away in uh, just uh, about a year and, and three months ago. Uh, I wanna pause a moment here. Um, this was um, in some ways a success, ultimately clinically for the patient and the family, uh, that type of failure um, that one captures in the cliche, the surgery was a success even though the patient died. Um, this was a first attempt and it did not ultimately go the way we wanted, but it provided a glimmer of hope for the possibility of developing these sorts of individualized genomic medicines. And this story has gotten a lot of press. As I mentioned, there's a lot of interest in the idea that this case has come to symbolize. The idea that medicines now are reaching a point when they're, they're, they may deserve the term programmable medicines that you have drugs like nusinersen up on top in green and drugs like Nielsen, the drug that we made for our patient in blue, that use the exact same chemistry, but uh, tailored genetically to ad address a different sequence. Um, and could you use this approach to rapidly make drugs for all sorts of different indications and to accelerate the process by which we treat uh, diseases, rare diseases, and even potentially individuals? And this is the idea that I'd like to spend some time discussing to wrap up here. Um, what we're really talking about is a platform drug. Uh, traditionally drugs, uh, the traditional model is there's one unique drug for one unique indication, Tylenol, penicillin, Taxol, metformin. These are small molecule drugs. Each drug is like an ice crystal developing and growing into its own unique snowflake via a process which is not easily repeatable with any sort of consistency. And instead, what we're talking about is a new revolution, a new wave of platform-based drugs, um, gene therapy, antisense oligonucleotides, mRNA therapy, siRNAs, CRISPR genome editing. These are all genetically targeted drugs. And the beauty of genetics is that they is, it is naturally a platform. There's a code to it. There's a logic to it. They are genetically programmable such that a traditional small molecule drug, which has a particular chemical structure, you can think of it as having two uh, properties, uh, the dianophore, the pharmacophore. The dianophore reflects the uptake, distribution, and safety of the drug. The pharmacophore 
reflects the biological target, what it's acting on. And for a small molecule drug, this is all encompassed in the same structure. In contrast, you have a programmable drug, an inf informational drug, where you've got something like this. There's a backbone, there's a sequence. The chemistry of the backbone and the, and the ligand dictates the dianophore properties, the uptake, the distribution, the safety. The sequence dictates this biological target. These two things are by and large, at least in principle, separatable so that you can modify the sequence while leaving the drug properties intact. And so it's this division, which is the, the basis for the excitement and leads to these terms, platform-based drugs, programmable medicines, informational therapies. Right now, ASOs are the most mature of the emerging platforms that, and they hold out this prospect of uh, leveraging these advantages to speed development. You can rapidly customize them. They're very simple to manufacture. As I mentioned, they're easy to deliver and there's a growing safety and efficacy record. And so uh, what we have now is the prospect of using these as a platform for testing, piloting individualized medicines or N of small, because it's not always just one. And could we do this in a way that could go after genetic diseases that are too small for commercial interest? Can we do this in a way that is, represents good science, that we validate our gene targets, probe critical gene therapeutic windows? Animal models are good, but sometimes you have to do a meaningful experiment. To do a meaningful experiment, sometimes it, arguably it has to be done in a patient. And can you do this in a way where you keep everything as constant as possible, but change the sequence? so that you can aggregate experiences and support this as a larger approach. Uh, we met with the FDA in May of 2019 in the wake of our first Mielsen experience. This was the first case that they had had of this nature. And we talked about these ideas. We talked about how this was, it was gonna be really critical that this is a field that could go into the space of lots of anecdotes. And you could have individual investigators uh, who are working in individual silos and uh, that really what we needed to do is organize these in some way to make them coherent uh, and to bring the anecdotes together because the plural of anecdotes doesn't mean data. You have to actually work hard to actually structure this in a way that makes it data. And how do you set patient expectations, have tr transparent inclusion criteria for who's eligible, who's not? Um, these are some of the things that we discussed and our paper actually um, as published in 2019 uh, ended up being accompanied by an editorial by uh, Janet Woodcock and Peter Marks talking about the regulatory issues um, and stances that would be required and, and, the, and the innovations that would be required to do this sort of thing. And people are doing this sort of thing. You know, from our paper in 2019, we've seen now groups, other groups uh, develop individualize ASOs and advance them in the same mode as Mielsen. Uh, the second example was uh, an example uh, on behalf of a 20 year old woman um, with a very severe and aggressive form of ALS. Her identical twin sister had actually died of it many years before. And when she began showing symptoms, uh, Neil Schneider at Columbia University partnered up with Ionis to take a antisense oligonucleotide drug and hurry it through the approval process along the same lines as Mielsen um, to begin uh, an end of one effort for her that eventually now has turned into a proper phase two, three trial, which is ongoing right now in many patients with that condition. And uh, also in 2022, 20, uh, early this year, um, my colleagues at the University of Massachusetts um, advanced an individualized antisense oligonucleotide for another patient with uh, a genetic form of ALS uh, with a customized antisense oligonucleotide. This was a different genetic form of ALS as well. And there are many, many more efforts like this that are ongoing right now uh, to use these to develop uh, drugs for very rare conditions. I wanna pause and say, you know, we have to be cautious to uh, point out that managing family expectations is really important. There are many hazards in this type of work. We have to make sure not to raise expectations too quickly. Can't afford to have cowboys in this space. But we are working to advance the ball 
at Children's, um, here are a couple of cases that we've taken on, my laboratory has taken on since the Mielison case. Here's one of them, a baby girl who is accidentally diagnosed with a fatal condition at birth. She had an abnormal newborn screen that actually had her doctors worried that she might have a severe combined immunodeficiency, that she might have a bubble boy syndrome, so to speak. It turns out that she doesn't have an immunodeficiency. She actually has a progressive cerebellar genetic disorder. Um, it causes, it's called ataxia telangiectasia. These children are born with mild immunologic abnormalities, but their main problem is that they lose coordination of their muscles, they become unable to walk, talk, speak, read, swallow. They end up um, requiring wheelchairs by age 10 and it's fatal by uh, on average around uh, mid twenties. This baby girl was diagnosed with this at birth before the onset of symptoms. And there are no available treatments for this condition. However, one of her mutations, even though there's no pill you can take or a gene therapy rescue for, it, for this condition, she had a particular mutation that created a new splice site, just like our Mielison mutation. This was her mutation. It was a C to T change within the 53rd exon of the ATM gene. If you'll notice the C to T change actually created a GT splice donor site. And that splice donor site actually overrode the native donor site. And it began being used in such a way that actually clipped the end of exon 53 and led to a non-functional protein product. So you can imagine exactly what we did. We did exactly what we did in Mielison. We designed antisense oligonucleotides to block this abnormal splicing. We showed in patient cells, skin cells, that you could rescue normal splicing in a dose-dependent way. This top band is normal splicing. The bottom band is the abnormal splicing. Here are increasing concentrations of our drug and we're able to rescue that normal transcript. We did functional assays showing you could rescue signal transduction through the ATM pathway. ATM mediates the cellular response to DNA damage. And so as these cells are designed and engineered to light up green in immunofluorescence experiments, uh, signaling activation of that pathway. In the absence of drug, our patient cells fail to do that, but administration of one of these two candidate lead drugs shows that we can rescue the screen staining. And with evidence like that, uh, we were able to begin treating our patient by the time she turned age uh, turned two. Um, it took us 18 months, a little bit longer to make this drug, uh, but we began treating her. And she. this would be the first uh, effort to have a disease modifying intervention for ataxia telangiectasia. Our work with this uh, disease also connected us to a, a family foundation, the AT Children's Project, which, which represents many families with AT. They supported this work. Their work allowed us, their prior work, they had established a registry of patients with AT um, who had all went, underwent whole genome sequencing. And uh, we, working with them, we were able to answer the question, what fraction of their cases might be amenable to this type of antisense oligonucleotide treatment strategy. I'll just take you to the red box. The answer turned out to be that of the 235 cases in their registry, 36 of those individuals had at least one variant that was potentially amenable to this type of strategy. Now, highlighting the promise of that, I mean, that's a significant fraction, it's 15%, it's not all of them. It's just a subset, but it's a significant fraction. Highlighting the challenge though, if you wanted to actually treat all 36 of those subjects, you would need up to 23 different ASOs because they didn't all have the same mutation. So that also speaks to the fact that if this is gonna work, we're really gonna have to be able to churn these types of drugs out much, much more efficiently than we can currently today. I'd like to close with one last case. Um, this is a two-year-old with an infantile onset epilepsy. There are a lot of words on the slide. Let me just focus you on the key ones. This is a very severe form of genetic epilepsy that shows up in the first few days of life. This child illustrated here is in the NICU. Um, and these children have dozens of seizures per day. They're caused by genetic mutations that create de novo missense mutations in a potassium channel called the KCNT1 SLAC channel. These missense mutations 
um, cause neuronal hyperexcitability. And if you are unlucky enough to have this uh, mutation and this syndrome, you have neurodevelopmental stagnation and early death. A case series of 17 patients with this condition showed all of them to have severe to profound neurologic impairment, unable bed bound with no significant ability to communicate with the world. And half of these patients, uh, well, they were all having dozens of seizures per day and half of them died at a median age of just three. So this is a terrible, terrible condition. The mutations in this potassium channel all cause neuronal hyperexcitability. What do they do? They make the channels leaky. They increase the permeability of the channel to potassium by 25 times above normal. These are wild type current traces. These are the mutant current traces. They're hugely exaggerated. And the consequence of that is that you have lots of extra spikes in human iPS derived neurons in this condition compared to wild type. And that lends itself to a very simple strategy of trying to get rid of the leaky channel. A KCNT1 knockdown strategy using an ASO in this case, not to change splicing, but to actually trick the cell into reducing the amount of that gene uh, by activating RNAs H. You can design ASOs to bind to mRNAs to make it think it's a viral invader. And RNAs H is the cellular cytoplasmic uh, enzyme that helps get rid of viruses by recognizing RNA DNA hybrids, um, cleaving the transcripts and allowing you to clear this toxic gene product we uh, put together a preclinical package showing that uh, we could knock down casein T1 using an ASO in cell lines, cancer lines, patient lines. We did some experiments in mice, in mouse models of casein T1 epilepsy. We showed you could rescue behavior and rescue lifespan and seizures in a mouse casein T1 epilepsy model. And we were granted permission to proceed by the FDA in, in September of 2020. We enrolled two patients. Uh, patient one had a modest decline in seizures shown over time here. This is the same type of graph as before, seizures per day on the y-axis, doses in the orange stars. There was a modest but believable decline in seizures over time. Patient number two gave us a much clearer teaching example. Patient number two was having between five and 15 seizures per day at the outset of the trial. She received one, two, three, four doses and seizures went to zero and they stayed at zero for about 50 days. The fourth dose, after the fourth dose, we gave no further doses, held the dosing and you see that seizures gradually responded, returned, showing a clear on and then off response showing as clear of a sign of pharmacologic engagement as one can imagine. Of course, you're probably wondering why, if it was looking that good, why in the world would one stop? And here I wanna highlight that uh, both promise and peril with these efforts, that the reason that we didn't give a dose beyond the fourth dose is that our patient actually had a serious adverse event, a bad side effect. She had a ventricular enlargement. This is. Uh, an enlargement of the, vent the brain ventricles, which are fluid-filled spaces in the brain that are responsible for circulation of uh, various um, proteins throughout the central nervous system. And the normal machinery to reabsorb that fluid after it circulates appeared to be dysfunctional in our patient after the fourth dose. And she required um, then to have an emergency uh, neurosurgical procedure to shunt the fluid from her ventricles uh, to relieve pressure. And so we had to hold dosing for many months. That was an unanticipated side effect um, that just illustrates that risk and benefit for these efforts is really critical to think through in advance. Um, and I will say that given the grim prognosis of this condition, despite having this happen, and despite not knowing what's causing it, uh, with the shunt in place, she's protected from the effects. And so we are now considering um, lowering our dose. We think that this happened because we dosed too high and too fast. Um, we're considering uh, restarting the trial um, despite having this effect, just to speak to the fact that these are all individual decisions based on the severity of the condition. <laughs>
So with that, let me just say um, what this talk is about is about therapeutic platforms and how genomics led to a revolution in diagnosis. It's leading to a revolution in therapy. And this revolution in therapy um, is prompting the FDA to um, change their game, to release guidances for how to actually act under these situations. Uh, there were a series of four guidances released last year that ratified the Nielsen precedent. They're the first uh, words that the FDA has spoken about individualized medicine in its history. Um, and they just speak to the fact that there's an opportunity now that we're, we're right on the cusp of. I wanted to thank, there are many groups that are stepping in to help work in this space. There's a foundation now created by the company Ionis uh, to make medicines for ultra rare conditions, to make the ISO medicines for ultra rare conditions on a charitable basis. There are folks in Europe who are working in this space to develop guidelines with us. We ourselves have started up a collaborative to help uh, coordinate academic conversations, to develop best practices internationally for this type of work. And the hope is that through these uh, efforts like this, we can help and reach more patients. Uh, we can also begin to change this slide, uh, that uh, drug approvals sh shouldn't have to cost $2.6 billion in 14 years. And actually, you know, we might be able to pull a trick here. Uh, it turns out in looking at these statistics and thinking how we can improve them, uh, I was struck that the Human Genome Project, which you've likely heard about through your program, um, was completed in 1990 at the cost of $2.7 billion and 13 years. But now in 2022, it costs $1,000 to sequence a genome. What if we could pull that same trick for drug development? If new drug approvals could be shrunk similarly from $2.6 billion in 14 years to something much, much smaller, say by 2040. I think that's the central challenge and the central uh, uh, idea that I'll leave you all with um, and uh, thank you so much for your attention. I'll stop there. Okay, so now if you have questions in the screen and you'd like to ask them, this is your chance to do so. Just speak up really loudly, try not to mumble. Um, and if he cannot hear your question, then Team A, right there at the front, or related questions. I have a question. Go for it. Thank you. Can you please explain the process you and your team took from looking at the chimera reads to like deducing that these were caused by XB retro transposons? Sure. So I think the, the question was can I explain more about that? process that I glossed over, how we saw these chimeric reads and how we figured out that they were uh, due to a retrotransposon. Um, well, this was a bit of pattern recognition. So uh, what we simply saw were that, you, first you just follow the reads that you see. You see reads that line up with the CLN7 locus, and you see that at some point there's a break point and then they line up with a different sequence. And so the, the question that arises is where does that sequence come from? You see a poly T stretch on one side, the other half of the sequences show the, the taxameric repeat. What we figured out was that um, what we were likely seeing was a, a, this uh, insertion uh, of extra DNA that began on one side with the poly T sequence, ended on the other side with the hexameric sequence. And, the, and that's as far as we could see. We knew that it, what it began with and what it ended with. So it's a little bit like playing hangman where you know it's a long word, you don't know how long it is, but you have the first 15 letters on one side and you have the last 15 letters on the other side and there's a, a indeterminate length in between. Um, it was really a matter of pattern recognition. Um, we began asking, you know, it could be any random sequence that uh, had inserted itself there, but we began looking at the family of um, mobile DNA elements to ask what are their characteristic five prime and three prime sequences? And it turns out that some of them, uh, it's the S, there are uh, just a handful of, of different classes of mobile DNA elements. Um, and if you look at their characteristic structure, the SVA um, subfamily ends on one side with a poly A tail. Okay, that's a poly A tail. And on the other side, it ended, uh, the, the, uh, it, on the five prime side, it has a hexameric repeat 
which was the reverse complement of what we had seen in our chimeric reads. So it was really just that looking through the literature enough to find existing variants that could it could be, and then we found that match, and then we realized that that's what, what we were looking at. Um, I had a question more, I guess, about the clinical process you guys had in developing personalized drugs and what specifically you did differently in terms of, I guess, commercial drugs and then more personalized drugs, because obviously that process was much quicker. And I just wanted to know the details of what really was different about that. Great question. So um, ultimately, at, at, at the end of the day, um, commercial drug development is driven by a, a, a case, a, someone making a business case for an investment. Um, and fundamentally, we were taking on um, drugs, uh, drug development opportunities that uh, were applicable to one or two or maybe five or seven patients in less than 10 patients at a time. Um, so we had to, uh, there's under no stretch of the imagination would any company take these on because there would be no return for it. Um, and so when we explained the situation to the FDA, we said, well, um, there's an industry standard for how these drugs should be developed that uh, some of it is based off of science and some of it is just based off of tr uh, tradition. There is a rule that industry drugs have to be tested, for instance, um, in two different species before administering to patients. Um, and ideally one of those species should be a relevant animal model. It should be a model of the disease. Well, in the Mielsen case, there was no mouse model for our patient's mutation. There was no relevant mutation. Um, we would, if one could have created one, but we would have had to engineer somehow a human SVA retron transposon into a mouse genome and then develop a drug for it. And that's like a, a five-year product uh, project that would have no scientific basis. Wouldn't make any sense to do it. Furthermore, um, the two species requirement, the two species requirement is one that's typically, it was installed because in a world of small molecule drugs, every drug can do something different. It can do something unexpected. It can have an unusual toxicity. It might cause heart arrhythmias. It might cause your skin to turn blue. It might cause you know, kidney failure. But for antisense oligonucleotides, antisense oligonucleotides have been given to lots and lots of animals. And they have relatively stereotyped safety profiles. And we know that they don't turn your skin blue. They don't cause, well, they can cause kidney issues if given at the wrong doses. Uh, but they know, we know that there's a limited number of things that you have to worry about. So the argument for a second species to ferret those out uh, didn't hold as much water um, as for a traditional commercial drug. So the short version is, I know it was a long answer, uh, but the species um, requirement, we did one species instead of two. And for manufacturing purposes, there are also lots and lots of bells and whistles on quality control, uh, like looking for heavy metals and this and that and the other thing um, that are typically done. Instead of doing those, which would have taken months and way more expense, we said, instead of doing those, we're just going to take our drug and we're going to, uh, as prepared for our patient, we're gonna inject it into rats. And um, the rats will be our quality control to make sure there's no, say, heavy metal poisoning or something like that. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, so I know that uh, developing the degree manuscripts from Stanford University is complicated as a development of the drug itself. So I was wondering for, uh, I mean, specifically for GSM license, are you going to put that uh, like drug groups? How does the delivery method work? And specifically in the context of the demand. System? I'm super sorry. I'm, I'm having trouble um, uh, hearing clearly. I, uh, could you try it one more time? Yeah. So, like, in terms of how the delivery of drugs work. Can you hear me? Yes, in terms of the delivery of the drugs. Yeah, because I know that at least in this case of neurodegenerative uh, diseases, that's usually an issue, I mean, at least in terms of accessibility, because like there's a lot of factors, such as like, like uh, blood brain barrier, permeability, and right. because it's really like people to access the So how does it work? Yeah, so 
if I understood right, the, the question is about what's, uh, how is this drug delivered and, and, and why is this a reasonable thing? You know, maybe not explicitly asked, but uh, I'll infer, you know, um, how do we know that the distribution of the drug is such that an intervention is even plausible, given that lots of different drugs aren't delivered to the right place at the right time? So um, let's just say, for instance, for gene replacement therapies, like a viral re replacement, uh, we have these wonderful vectors, AAV vectors that are adapted from animal viruses that can be now injected into patients and can go to various places, but they don't go to all circuits or all brain regions equally and getting the dose right is very tricky. Um, and there's questions of blood brain barrier and so forth. It turns out that ASOs, if I might be a little bit uh, loose in my vocabulary, uh, if ASOs have a superpower, it's in biodistribution. ASOs given intrathecally are expressed throughout, uh, end up being just delivered throughout the spinal cord, brainstem, cerebellum, and cortex quite smoothly. There's a three to five fold gradient in concentration, but it gets into each of those regions. There are some regions where it doesn't get quite as good exposure um, as other regions. Like it turns out like the deep nuclei, like basal ganglia in the brain, um, where the seat of Huntington's disease is expressed, for instance, that it's a little harder to get the drug into there. But overall, they're quite evenly distributed with those exceptions. The second piece is that the cell type, um, that the cell types that these get into are also very, very broad. That ASOs without a virus or without a lipid nanoparticle or anything like that, just naked antisense oligonucleotide delivered in normal saline or phosphate buffered saline or something like that is taken up by all cell types in the central nervous system. So um, if they have a superpower at this point in 2022, it's that the delivery problem is relatively simple for ASOs. You just have to inject it into the spine. If you inject it into the blood IV, it doesn't go into the central nervous system, but if you give it by spinal tap, it gets everywhere you want it to go. I'm so sorry. I'm still having, I'm, it, it's just uh, not quite loud enough. Okay, you have to speak up really, really loud. Okay. Yeah. So you often work with children and this is complications when the change in physiology uh, of children. What do you think is your best approach to the coming to like a diagnosis? And also like since most neurodegenerative disorders have like attack gears and things like I, I think I caught the gist of it. I probably caught about 75% of the words, but I think I caught the gist of it. The first is working with pediatric patients. Um, and I, I'm going to have to ask someone to fill in the 25% about pediatric patients. The, the second is about whether parents can recognize the symptoms so that they can describe them accurately to, uh, for appropriate diagnosis. Um, let me do the second one first, because I think I got the gist of that. And then someone can help me with the first. Um, Many families will tell you that we didn't even know that these sorts of diseases exist in the world. That when their child begins sh showing these unusual things, um, they, they are actually, uh, uh, they admit and actually maybe are even upset about the fact that no one ever told them that something like this, that there are diseases that could actually cause my child to um, have symptoms like this that I had to worry about. And that's probably because we don't spend a lot of time in, in pediatrics counseling families about all of the terrible and very, very rare conditions that their child could have because of what the stress that would create. Um, so the answer is no. I, I, I think it's a very good point that you make that families are not well equipped by and large to recognize, especially these unusual neurologic symptoms, which are quite movement disorders, dystonias, uh, ataxia and discoordination. Um, people train for years to distinguish these and uh, they're not easily describable. That is changing though with the internet and with videos and with folks 
that are now able to, uh, you know, our family described um, actually realizing that this was probably Batten disease when they started looking on YouTube and seeing videos of other children. All of a sudden they saw a match with what they'd been seeing and puzzling over the last several years. So I think that making these sorts of libraries, the video libraries available, even if they don't have the words to describe it so that they can recognize the patterns, I think that those are important ways to accelerate that. I'm sorry about the first part of the question. It was about working with kids, but I didn't catch it. Like in pediatric populations, since they cannot explain the symptoms themselves, what do you think is your approach to teaching like a proper diagnosis? I think that, uh, right, if you can't explain it, at, at least we can sequence it. How about that for a, 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 a quick, uh, I think that the idea that um, the clinical syndrome often uh, we pride ourselves in medicine on being able to make the diagnosis from history, from an exam. Um, I think that we have to also perhaps let go a little bit of that pride and perhaps elicit the history, perform the exam, and do the testing in parallel. Because uh, there are many ways in which neurologists, geneticists, pediatricians can be fooled by exams. And so getting to the point where we can do genetic testing more quickly to supplement the exam may be a faster way to uh, making sure we don't miss things or delay diagnoses. Thank you so much. I have a question. It's about what we do in studies and the research. Uh, when you have patients and they have drugs, how exactly do you know that they need to take those drugs? I heard you say, how exactly do you know? And then it, I lost, I trailed off and I missed that last part. How exactly do you know what amount or when you can increase the dosage that you're gonna apply or like put in the patient or the drug that you Would someone who's in the room and able to hear without distortion uh, repeat that question for me? Um, so someone asked, how exactly do you know when to up the dosage for you're doing experiments and trials? Really important question. And, and the reality is it's very difficult uh, here. Uh, normally when one sets the dosage in a trial, it may be because you've dosed animal models of disease and you figured out what the right dosing should be based off of prior data. Um, in the Mielsen case and for every of the other cases that I mentioned, uh, well, for the Mielsen case and the ataxia telangiectasia case, there was no animal model of disease appropriate with which we could try to establish a dosage. So what we have to go on are the reliable biodistribution properties of the drug. We know that giving this drug at a certain dose should get about this amount of drug into different brain regions. And we have to estimate based off of how much drug we know we can drive into that tissue. We have to ask, well, how much of the gene is there and what's the concentration of the gene transcript? Um, and so we have to make our dosing decisions uh, using these estimates. Um, it's incredibly helpful to also have a rapidly responsive indicator for how the drug is working. In Mila's case, there were seizures that responded quickly. In the last case that I presented, seizures also responded quite quickly. And so you can titrate the drug up or down based off of what the seizures are doing. There are some conditions where you do not have that luxury. The ataxia telangiectasia, we cannot tell based off of their, their seizures are not a part of that condition. So our dose finding and our dose adjustments are a lot more guesswork, to be honest. Could you explain what characteristics of the disease make it treatable by ASOs? And I guess the process that you take in deciding whether ASOs are the best course of action uh, that's a really important uh, question. So for now, antisense oligonucleotides are um, very well vetted in the brain, spinal cord, and eye. Um, and by very well vetted, I mean that there have been multiple investigational clinical trials in those organs showing a pretty good safety record and uh, a pretty good efficacy record. Um, they have other attractive characteristics. Those, those tissues have other attractive characteristics. Uh, when you give them into those regions, into the spinal cord, brain, eye, um, those are compartments that are relatively self-contained. So when you give it into the eye, a small amount of drug um, 
given into the eye will stay there for up to six months and it will not pass into other tissues. Same thing for intrathecal delivery. If you give it into the spinal, by spinal tap, the drug, 99% of the drug gets taken up in the brain itself um, and doesn't go leak into the systemic circulation. What that means is that since the drug stays where you put it for a long time, you can get away with very small doses. If the drug were leaking out all the time, like you know a, a punctured shopping bag, then you have to give high doses and you have to give it frequently to keep the levels up. But with uh, in the eye and the brain, you can give it between two to four times per year and uh, um, have it last long enough so that uh, you can go long intervals. Um, and again, with low doses. So those are the tissues that are especially good right now. There's, it turns out that there are other places where antisense oligonucleotides will naturally go. One of those is the liver. Um, in fact, you can enhance that by adding a GALNAC residue to antisense oligonucleotides that allows uh, the ASO to be taken specifically by the liver. So if you do that and give it IV or sub Q, you can drive high concentrations to the liver and it'll be targeted and compartmentalized there. So that's another place where there have been uh, some good clinical successes and where this type of approach could be used. What are some, what are some bad places? Kidney disease, muscle disease, uh, multi-organ disease. Uh, that's a lot harder to address with an ASO because um, if you just give it straight into the bloodstream, it goes into different organs at different concentrations and you run the risk of underdosing some organs and way overdosing other organs. So it's a lot trickier to deal with. So we are thinking primarily about brain and eye and liver. One other thing I failed to mention, um, but is critically important. Um, this is still early stage research. Um, it's only the sickest patients uh, with severely debilitating or life-threatening or fatal conditions where this ought to be uh, contemplated. Um, also similarly, if there are other treatments available for the condition, um, one has to ask, what are you doing making an antisense oligonucleotide if there's another good alternative? Um, I personally and many in the field are becoming to agree that antisense oligonucleotides have the chance to be the tip of the spear. They can de-risk interventions in a disease uh, because they're easy to prototype and make these medicines up for small numbers of individuals. The learnings from those small numbers of individuals can tell you if a drug is reverse, with a, if a disease is reversible at a certain stage, um, and if it works, if it shows promise, then you can design a quote unquote forever therapy. You could come back now and spend a few more years and many, many more millions of dollars developing a gene replacement therapy or a CRISPR therapy or something like that, having generated some early pilot data from an individualized approach. Thank you. I have a question. So um, in the future, as this becomes more common practice, what are like the, the ethical implications of deciding which of the rare diseases to get chosen to study? And then also like, how do you know like who is going to be able to have access to just like whole genome sequencing and designing like personalized drugs? Great question. And. Um, I would say that it's a, it's a great question and one that deserves a lot of thought and I won't try to give a pat answer to it. Um, but I would at least break it up into two phases. I would say that there's one answer that we need to have in mind right now, which is what do you do with a technology like this in its very early days? We have a total of five patients, six patients, seven pa about seven patients in the world today have received a truly individualized drug under the parameters that I've described. Actually, no, eight. Okay, I can think of all eight of them. Um, there've been eight. And what that means is that we're at the very, very early stages of this field. Uh, we can't with conviction say to families what the success rate is, what the failure rate is. This is all early stage stuff. In this early investigational phase, it's incumbent on us to pick good cases to pick cases where the unknowns are appropriately acknowledged, um, to pick really just the most severe cases, um, that's the place to start. It should also be said that you have to fit very specific genetic criteria to be eligible for this strategy. 
this is, uh, I've talked about two types of mutations that can be treated with this approach. The first is a very particular type of gain of splice mutation. The second are mutations that create a toxic protein that you can knock down. Those are very specific scenarios and actually don't apply to the majority of patients. So the scientific eligibility and the ethical criteria have to also take into account that it's a pretty narrow aperture of opportunity, scientific opportunities that we've got too. So in the early days, we have to pick cases that are severe and um, actually are informative uh, because if you help a patient, it's wonderful to help a patient. Uh, but in an era where you don't know if this is going to be sustainable or what the, the long-term you know, um, uh, learnings will be, you have to make sure that each case that you select is going to help inform uh, the rest of the cases. Sorry for all the background noise. Um, having said that, let's say that we successfully show that there is uh, success in, uh, let's say, 60% of cases and that there's toxicity in say only 5% of cases. And the some like, acceptable, pick your risk benefit profile, right? From there, the conversations get much, once you've now shown that, and now you're in the mode of offering this treatment to uh, people under sort of societally approved ethical norms and making sure access is, is granted. Um, there, we get into conversations about, well, at the end of the day, how much is it all going to cost? Uh, is it going to be a $10,000 effort, a $100,000 effort, a million dollar effort? Um, and how do we make decisions about access to um, medical interventions with different price tags? Well, luckily, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have approaches to thinking about these problems. We have things like medically complicated heart transplants, kidney transplants, um, any sorts of intervention that is high risk, potentially high reward, but also high resource and high expenditure. Um, and we have ways where we sit down as a society and talk about setting up, say, uh, uh, transplantation boards, um, or we have uh, legislatures sit down and talk about, well, what is the amount of support that we're willing, uh, the amount of money we're willing to spend on uh, dialysis uh, for healthcare costs in the state of Oregon, or something like that. We have ways of actually thinking about these things that uh, will allow us to, uh, to work through it and to figure it out. But it depends on if it works and at the end, how much it all costs. Well, I had a question that's a little bit, um, I guess, diverging away from your talk today, but it's based on a different study that I've read of yours specifically on autism spectrum disorder. And I know that it's a very broad range of a disorder. And I was wondering with the work that you've done, how much do we, can we really know about autism spectrum disorder within us through genetics and through our genome? Yeah, that's, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about autism. So all of this work began um, when our laboratory was really supposed to be studying autism. Uh, and uh, that's actually what we were funded to do to uncover the causes of autism. And I will share, I see that this work actually has immense relevance to coming back to autism because autism at the end of the day, um, right now, the most headway in understanding this disorder is coming from human genetics, where we are able to uncover the genetic risk factors that are largely explanatory for patients uh, in about a quarter of cases, okay? The three quarters are still going undiagnosed, so I don't wanna sugarcoat that, but that what we are learning is about those cases that are genetic in origin. We are also learning that autism can be caused by hundreds of different genes. It's likely several hundred. Um, and that is at once exciting because we were able to name them. On the other hand, it's also disheartening because, well, if we're going to try and make patients' lives better, does that mean that we need hundreds of different therapies? Um, this all connects, though, because I believe that the type of technology that we now find ourselves working on through these sorts of platform technologies are exactly what's going to be necessary to address a disorder which is highly heterogeneous with lots of different causes. We're gonna to have to become much more efficient about uh, treating 
uh, about developing drugs, genetically targeted drugs, if we're going to treat a, uh, a condition that might have hundreds of different causes. So this does dovetail um, because I think that at the end of the day, we're going to have to find creative ways of grouping patients instead of necessarily grouping them as, hey, these are the patients who have shank three mutations. These are the patients who have norexin mutations. These are the patients who have SCN2A mutations. Um, we may have to think about them mechanistically. These are the patients with autism who have a splicing disorder. These are the patients with autism who have a nonsense mutation. Um, these are the patients who have a duplication that requires knockdown. We can classify them by the, what they share in terms of the therapeutic mechanism, not by the name of the gene. And then we can get really good at deploying those sorts of interventions uh, on, a, uh, on a mechanistic basis, not on a gene name basis. So uh, during your lecture, you highlighted briefly um, a few other gene therapy, or you listed briefly a few other gene therapy methods um, besides ASOs. Uh, one of the ones that I know you mentioned was CRISPR, and I know you mentioned antimicrobial like, responses. Um, can you explain how the potential of CRISPR and uh, generally gene editing compares to like the efficacy of other gene therapy methods, such as ASOs or other gene therapy methods? Yep, good question. So. In principle, CRISPR is the platform technology to rule them all, because for nearly any mutation, there's a class of CRISPR that seems to have now been uh, conceived of, and at least you know there's, there are patents on it, on ways of actually uh, correcting them. We have base editors uh, for correcting all sorts of single nucleotide substitutions. We have search and replace or find and replace prime editing. Uh, we have a whole variety of different CRISPR-based tools that in theory could let you do, uh, to, to uh, could in theory allow you to address almost any lesion that you could imagine occurring. Maybe one of the trickiest ones left is like triplet repeat expansions where we don't have a super well-controlled way of fixing those yet. Um, so in a way that th that is uh, the, the ultimate tool, uh, but, the problem if the Achilles heel of CRISPR right now is that it still requires viral delivery um, or multiple viral deliveries because the machinery is too big to fit in the single virus. And so we are back to that delivery problem. And um, we don't actually then therefore have as great of an opportunity to practice individualized medicine with CRISPR because the number of applications for which the delivery is worked out is relatively small. The ASO, um, ASO's weakness is that it's rather narrow in what it can do. It can knock genes down or it can modulate splicing patterns. But as I mentioned before, its superpower is that the delivery problem is solved. In my mind, um, ASOs might be a good place for us to begin to pioneer the individualized pathways required um, to practice them, to figure out the guidelines, to figure out the FDA rules, to figure out the ethical rules, to figure out the reimbursement strategy. Um, but really the big brother coming down the, down the, the uh, cresting the horizon uh, you know, that, that, uh, that this would be setting the stage for would be some, hopefully, uh, some more direct genomic modification once those other delivery issues are, are worked out. Um, so since uh, this might be more of a specific question, but um, since Mila's Batten disease is caused by a rarer hypermobile variant of um, Batten and not because she was homozygous recessive, was the onset or I guess any other manifestation of the disease any different? And then more generally, um, how do you go about diagnosing unique variants of potentially with altered symptoms? Great question. So, um, the Mila's mutation was a very unusual mutation. Um, and in theory, it could have been leaky. In theory, it could have been a mutation that um, allowed a little bit of residual function of the gene. Um, in fact, uh, we've seen that before where th there are certain gain of splice mutations that um, trap a gene, but only do so, you know, with not with 100% efficiency, but maybe with 70% efficiency or something like that. Um, 
In her particular case though, um, her clinical presentation and her biochemical phenotype uh, was consistent with a complete loss of function of the gene. So uh, her mutation, while unique, um, behaved in terms of age of onset and biochemical phenotype in her cells in a dish, like a classic simple truncating mutation in the coding region. Um, it's a really important question that you ask though, because um, you have to be on the lookout for genotype phenotype correlations that will, um, if you're gonna actually decide how urgent a case is, there are versions of, for instance, CLN7 Batten disease that are mild. Um, there are certain missense mutations that cause only blindness, but no other uh, uh, brain or spinal cord manifestations. Um, and you have to be aware of those because if you encounter, uh, you don't wanna overreact to uh, a mutation that you find. Um, perhaps there may be, and we have actually examples of this, patients who are primarily uh, presenting with uh, eye symptoms. And in those, uh, the right thing to do may be to do an intraocular injection to try and spare vision, to rescue vision, but you wouldn't necessarily want to expose the patient to a spinal tap because of the potential for toxicity in the spinal cord in the brain if they're actually not going to um, develop symptoms. So figuring out where in the spectrum of severity your particular patient is based on his or her mutations is really, uh, really critical. Was there a second part? I might've missed it. Um, I mean, I, I pretty much covered it, but okay. I did ask about, I don't know if there's altered symptoms due to some kind of um, unique variant in the patient. How do you make sure, you know, what specific disease disease they have? That's right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think yeah. Just I think that um, the second part. I think it's 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 a um, good follow on to the first. That understanding the nature of the mutation as well as the nature of the disease, understanding the severity of the mutation as well as the severity of the disease, is really important for judging risk at the outset when you're deciding whether or not to intervene or not. Um, and it's also really critically important for assessing how you did. Um, some people ask us, well, you know. Uh, could Mila have, could her seizures have gotten better on her own because maybe she had an unusual mutation that uh, where seizures would go and uh, uh, get better on their own. Um, and of course we have to say, we cannot rule that out, uh, but we've never seen a mutation that acts in that manner before in the prior history of CLN7 Batten disease. And by other biochemical measures, it looked indistinguishable from the standard classic uh, full loss of function mutations. I think someone's ask, asking a question, but this one I'm not hearing at all. Can you hear me now? You have to repeat it, I think. Um, I was just wondering, because I know you said you mentioned biomimetics, and I know that there are many many other groups that are working with autism, and I was just wondering if you could explain the process, like of what you're targeting with that. I heard you say biomarin and something about process, but I, I'm gonna have to ask you to try one more time or someone else to step in to. I, mean, I, think, I, think, I think she was talking about how biomarin is working on dwarfism and you know, drug, drug on the border of dwarfism. So can you explain like the process of how to tackle dwarfism, um, especially, specifically in biomarin? Oh, did you say dwarfism? Yeah. And the question is how is biomarin attacking dwarfism? Yeah, and how um, the general process of attacking the working organism is. Um, I, I'm not familiar with what they, that, that program, uh, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm very sorry to say. So I'd be happy to follow up with you afterwards though, if, if there, maybe I'm missing something, but I, I'm not familiar with what they, may, what they are doing in that space. Oh, what's my role with Biomarin? Yes. Okay, um, I've just been an ad hoc uh, advisor for a few ASO projects of theirs, um, 
So I don't have a view of everything that they're doing, that they've, um, they've asked me to, to advise them on, on rare disease programs that they, uh, on some rare disease programs that they're working on, but not all of the rare disease programs. Um, so I had a question regarding your research on autism spectrum disorders, and I've read some of your previous papers, and I guess since you've mentioned previously how there are many different genes that can cause autism spectrum disorder, how do you decide what genes to research specifically? That's a really um, that's a really good question about um, scientific. Uh, strategy and um, and um, I think that we are always so in um, in medicine there's a um, there's a uh, there's a saying when a patient comes in uh, with uh, to the emergency room with uh, with uh, with uh, a symptom. Um, your job as a doctor is to think about what they have, of course, right? That's not a surprise, but, but really it's a little bit more than that. Your job is to think about what are they most likely to have? Number two, what's the worst thing that they could have? Number three, what's the most treatable thing that they could have? Um, and the point of that, little anecdote is that um, it's not nearly as simple as you would think. You have to actually, you have, you have to consider what's most likely. You have to also consider what am I missing? You know, what do I make sure, want to make sure I'm not missing because it could kill them? Or what am I, what do I want to make sure I'm not missing because there's a very easy fix for it? I see this, uh, something similar is true when thinking about how you uh, address, uh, how, you, how you choose um, what to work on within the space of autism. Um, we're attracted to things that have a lot of explanatory power. We want to pick genes that um, might, they might be important because they cause a, lot, a large fraction of, of um, the genetic burden of disease, right? So that's one criteria. But we also want to look for opportunities uh, where a particular genetic mutation might only account for a tiny fraction of individuals but might have an obvious fix to it. For instance, we have identified a family uh, with mutations in a gene called FEV. We have a complete knockout of this gene called FEV and FEV actually encodes uh, a, a very unusual gene. If you look at the expression pattern of that gene in the brain, it's incredibly tightly restricted to a few nuclei in the brainstem that turn out to be all of the the nuclei where the developing serotonergic neurons of the brain are born. And these uh, patients um, had been, well, this uh, gene has been modeled in mice. And if you knock out this gene in mice, um, the serotonergic neurons fail to form. Um, and these patients have 90% lower serotonin, serotonin levels in the brain uh, than wild type. And that suggests that's of interest to us uh, as human geneticists, because it does suggest that there's a little bit of serotonin left in these individuals. And could you actually treat them with an SSRI to amplify the amount of serotonin signaling that they've got? Would that give us a, a toehold into asking questions about whether some of the phenotypes of autism might be reversible with something as simple as a pill that you can take by mouth. So understanding what's most common, what's most potentially most treatable, and then perhaps also understanding those conditions that are uh, those ge uh, genetic causes of autism that are most severe, that might kill you, or might be uh, associated with severe uh, neurologic regressions down the road. Those are, those are some of the ways that we think about picking projects to work in. All right, I think we're gonna have to cut it there um, because we do have one share so if you will please give Dr. Yu a big round of applause. Thanks so much. Great questions, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Yu. We really appreciate it all. My pleasure. Have a great, have a great rest of the program, everybody. Take care.